Life with Tommy. From New York to South Africa, author and inspirational speaker Timothy Maurice Webster has found his purpose helping others discover theirs. Who are you? He asks. Who would you like to be? From this emerges Personovation, the journey to personal brand innovation. Oh, you certainly do deserve that applause. Thanks Timothy so much. Webster, brand master extraordinaire. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, brand master. Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me. It's such an amazing audience and a great platform. And I'm really, I'm really grateful to work in the personal branding space. Because when you think about the story that surrounds your name, all of us have a story that surrounds our name. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, what's behind that story? For me, I've always been curious. I mean, always, you know, if you think of a friend of yours who carries like a Louis Vuitton purse, for example, why do you want to know if it's real or fake? Mm. Because you want to know what's the story behind the print. Like every human being has a unique sort of fingerprint, but what's the story behind the fingerprint? What makes you really you? And so personal branding for me is about helping people position their story to be taken serious rather than being undermined, overlooked, and taken for granted. How do you position your story where it should be uh, to live your goals and dreams? So branding is not about celebrities. It's not about being a Lira, it's not about being a, a Timothy Webster, it's not about being an Oprah or a Richard Branson, but you are saying that every single individual is yes. a brand. I'm saying that every single individual has a number of stakeholders that matters. One of my favorite personal branding stories is when a mother, when a child reaches up to their mother, what that child is saying is that I know you've got me. I know that no matter what, when I reach my hands up, that in my mind, you are branded mother. Nurturer, you've got me. Protector. Protector. And so that story is clear. Most of us don't have a clear story. We're not really sure what we're trying to say to the world. Actually, we're not even aware that we have a story. Sure. You know, yeah. because I think a lot of the times we just live from moment to moment, experience to experience. Sure. But never really take the time to say, who am I? Yes. What has my past been? Yes. How has my past influenced my present? And how is it then going to influence my future? It's a, it's a cognitive process that I don't know if a lot of us go through that. Yeah, I think we're taught to be, we have two fundamental sides of the brain. You have the human, we have the sort of the animal, the primitive sort of side. The, the human side of the brain has been told to be highly civilized and to control your thoughts and who you are, and you're supposed to get it right. Mm, mm. Well, meanwhile, the animal is just sort of thinking and feeling it's and creative. falling in love and creating things and so forth. And we make mistakes. And the bottom line is that, you know, society tries to convict you for making those mistakes. They even mm. have places for you to go. And so the animal gets wounded along the way. And so we get confused. And the bottom line is that the animal and as well as the human work together to create this bigger story. And we have to understand that being wounded at times is a part of the journey. And being able to say to yourself, it's actually okay that I failed yesterday. And this is what I've learned and this is what I'm gonna to try to uh, package into my new sort of brand to make me more uh, influential, more serious and so forth. And that's what I've tried to do my whole life is to say, yes, I screwed up over here, but how do I channel that into a fire to be better? It's, you know, it's exactly what Lira was actually talking about, self-acceptance. Yes. looking at yourself and saying, I'm not all good and I'm not sure. all bad. Absolutely. Here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses. Absolutely. And then being able to recognize your own thoughts and then deciding which of those thoughts you're going to absorb and which you're going to let go of. Sure. What's your story? Well, you know, I grew up on a farm in North Carolina long before I moved to New York. I came to South Africa for the first time about 10 years ago. But growing up, I grew up as a kid who's father tried to put a crown on top of me and say that I'm supposed to be a manufacturer. And despite the fact that I was like literally number three in my class, I, my community says to me, this is who you are. This is the limits of who you should be. A manufacturer of what? Of, of <laughs> cotton. Oh, cotton. Li oh. Literally. I know it sounds rough. So, <laughs> so you were raised in a cotton farm? Yeah, well, I was raised around a lot of cotton where the cotton that goes into Gap t-shirts and that type of thing. So ah. I needed to be in a factory and my family said to me, this is who you're gonna be. Because that's wealth. Yeah, for them, it's like you're gonna you're going rise up, you're gonna be a supervisor one day, you're gonna be a manager, and that's it. So I went to work in a factory. And that's sort of like 
uh, sort of define my journey. After three weeks of working in this factory, I told my father, you can have this sort of <laughs> idea of being a manufacturer back. This is who I really want to be. And he kicked me out of my house. He kicked me out of his house, no, no, rather. Yeah, exactly. His I was just about to say, no, he house. kicked you out yeah, of his exactly. house. <laughs> <laughs> he literally kicked me out, and I was homeless for a while. And But in that process of trying to go from his version of who he saw me as to being a writer and a creative person, shifting crowns was is really what my journey has been about, constantly. When I've outgrown what somebody else saw me as, when I've outgrown how I saw myself, how do I shift my crown around because your crown is what you are known for mm. in your own head as well as what society sees in you. So my journey in through life has been about how do I shift that crown to align with who I am now and be courageous enough to take it off, polish it when it gets a bit dirty, when I make some mistakes and so forth, and put it back on and assume that pose and take myself serious. Did you always know what it is that you wanted to do and who you wanted to be? You know, it's interesting. My, my latest book, Personovation, is a word that I made up. I don't mm. know if you know, you can make up a word and put it on Google and you can Google mark it. Oh, really? Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to make up words. I physically used to make up words. My, my friends in high school used to tease me because I used to, I used to, I felt <laughs> like I had ideas that there currently is not a word for. You must have been and, your English teacher's worst nightmare. Yeah, I was. But now, like, I've signed books for them, and they're very sort of proud of this making up word type of thing. But the point is that... <laughs> so weird is good. Yes, exactly. Weird <laughs> is really good. But here's the thing, is that to have the courage to say to yourself that what's coming out of me matters is extremely important. And it's really come from a deeper spiritual relationship. Like, I don't necessarily say you have to be very religious, but I think you need to be in tune to settle your thoughts. Because when a powerful idea comes and a powerful thing rises up in your spirit, you need to have your thoughts collected to be able to receive it. And I really feel like most people's spirits are sort of chaotically all over the place. Their minds are here, they're watching too much TV, they on social media too much, and they're not centered. So when an idea comes, it passes them by. And I sort of settled into the fact that if God created me unique, He's going to send some amazing ideas my way. It doesn't necessarily make me so special. It just makes me a vessel that he happens to put on earth. And how do you actually take those ideas and manifest them into something tangible? Because, you know, people have, you know, ideas a dime a dozen, but nothing ever materializes. What is it that would differentiate you from your, your neighbor in the cotton fields? Sure. I feel like whatever it is you're most passionate about is the thing that you're going to excel at. I mean, some of the great philosophers and great thinkers believe deeply that the thing that you're more passionate about, you're given more provision for in the parts of the brain, like the dopamine process, is that that part of the brain activates and excels and, and, and fires at a higher pace than the things that you're most passionate about. So the first thing is to be clear on what you're most passionate about because then you have a framework for which that thing fits into. Mm. So as a writer, if I have an idea as a writer, then I'm clear that I can publish that somewhere. So then I have, I need to have the right associates, the right partners. As you know, I write for, I've been writing a column for the Star newspaper for 10 years. So having the Star as a partner is very important for me to say that I can now build a relationship with someone who also believes in me. So relationships are extremely important as you sort of frame your own perspective of how you see yourself and bring other people on board to be able to share your gift, whether it's mm. a company or whether it's a media. But what I really like about what you're saying is that the importance is actually in the doing. Yes. That is where the real power comes from. Sure. And once you create and you actually have something, then those relationships will be formed as well. Yes. And I think what a lot of us tend to do is you say, oh, I don't have this, I don't have relationships, I don't have money, I don't have resources, I don't know anybody, I don't have an education. You, there are many reasons why you cannot sure. do it. Yeah. But if you just do it. Your creator does not give you ideas without there being a provision for that idea, without there being somewhere for that idea to live. That idea comes because there is an opportunity for you and he thinks you're special enough to be able to translate that idea into some sort of a tangible economic benefit for yourself. It comes to you 
through, through you, you absolutely. for the absolutely. world. That's Timothy Webster, thank you so much for joining us on Life thank with Tommy. And I, I love hearing you speak. I love your workshops. Thank and you you're my much. writing buddy yes, in that exactly. other magazine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Mm, thank, thank you so you. much. That's uh, Timothy Webster living a life that really he has created and showing others how to do that as well. I don't know and I cannot think of a better way of being and of living. We'll be back after the break. Life with Tommy.